So I'd like to introduce uh, one of the young uh, people working here at the University of Washington, Katie Dawson. She comes to us originally from the University of Nevada, where she went to uh, undergrad and medical school. She then went to some strange place to do residency. Apparently, it's in a state south of us. Some like C team horrible me some medical health program, science health sciences thing. Apparently, so bad, Phil Knight took his money back from them um, and then gave it to Providence, which tried to be nuts. She didn't give it to us. Then she made a good decision and came up to the University of Washington to do her general cardiology fellowship. And she's done a bunch of research with our structural interventional group. She then made, uh, probably in most people's opinions, an unwise decision to become a non cognitive cardiologist working with the interventional cardiology section. And we're looking forward to having her join us in 13 months. Katie's here today to talk to us about outcome disparities in young women with acute myocardial infarction. Katie? Thank you, Dr. Lombardi. Uh, good morning. This, today I'll be discussing outcome disparities in young women with acute myocardial infarction. I chose this topic partially because I'm going to be an interventional cardiology fellow and will see these patients in my clinical practice, but more because of several patient experiences that I had during my fellowship, which really changed how I think about this patient population. I have no notable disclosures, or any, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> So my objectives for this talk are to have an updated discussion regarding disease prevalence and mortality trends in young women with acute MI in the United States. For the purposes of this talk, young women will mean, for the most part, less than the age of 55, which is the age where most of these studies have been done. I'm going to cover some clinical features that may explain the rising disease prevalence in this patient population and why we're seeing them more. And I'm going to highlight some aspects of their care that may place them at risk for worse outcomes, specifically the fact that these women remain under recognized and undertreated for their disease. And finally, I'll discuss areas that I hope we can focus on to improve outcomes in this patient group. But first, I'd like to start with Sarah, who's a young woman that I met during my first year of fellowship. She was a graduate student at the University of Washington, and she came to her PCP after moving to Seattle with about three months of epigastric pain. This was initially attributed to acid reflux, as it often is, and she was treated with a PPI. Shortly after that clinic visit, she actually came to the ER with severe abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, and was actually found to have a random fasting glucose of over 400. She was obviously subsequently diagnosed with very poorly controlled diabetes. And her cholesterol at that time was not normal. She had a mildly elevated LDL and a low HDL, but despite these numbers and despite her new diagnosis, she wasn't actually given a statin because she was planning on getting pregnant in the next year. <coughs> she was seen in follow-up by her PCP, primarily for insulin titration at that point, but to continue to uh, complain of this abdominal pain. It got a little bit better with the PPI, but it never really went away. And after a few weeks of follow-up visits, she started to say that, you know, my pain's a little bit worse when I walk to class. And actually, during that same visit, she described to her PCP that actually her dad had his first MI at age 40. But she was a student and anxious and a woman, and so her pain was, contributed to, was attributed to poorly treated acid reflux and maybe some anxiety. And she was given a referral to our GI doctors here. Shortly after that, she came to the hospital with refractory abdominal pain. Well, these played yesterday. Always, right? Um, okay, I will describe them to you. So she got admitted to the cardiac service and the following morning underwent angiography. And what would you would see if my videos would play like they did yesterday um, is that she had a 95% stenosis in her proximal LAD. The rest of her coronary arteries actually looked pretty good. Her right coronary artery, which I don't show you here, just like I don't show you her actual angiogram, was similarly relatively free of disease. Now, I know I'm standing in a room full of cardiology providers who take care of cardiovascular disease patients day in and day out. So Stair's story may not be that surprising to you, but I was surprised. I mean, well, first I was just happy that I got the radial access with 
without having to have someone else help me. But after that, I was surprised. But I probably shouldn't have been. Yes, she was young, but she had diabetes. And we're all well aware that diabetes increases your risk of cardiovascular disease and doesn't really care about your age or your gender, things that typically place young women like Sarah at much lower risk than men and older patients. And so that's what I'd like to spend the rest of my talk discussing, is the fact that when young women like Sarah remain underrecognized and undertreated. Cardiovascular disease has historically been considered a disease of men, so much so that ads targeted to women about cardiovascular disease in the 1960s and 1970s were primarily focused on preventing heart disease in their husbands. In fact, the first women's conference on coronary heart disease, which was in Portland, Oregon in 1964, was entitled Coronary Heart Disease, Hearts and Husbands. Now, I would really love to tell you that our image of the old man hunched over clutching his chest is no longer how we think about coronary artery disease in the US, that we're more inclusive. But even today, if you Google image search heart attack, you get this image, and this image, and this image, and this image, and this image, you get my point. You don't actually reach a picture of a woman until 20 lines down <coughs> on the search. Despite this, we all know that women are at risk for heart disease. The CDC publishes mortality data every year. And since the 1980s or so, heart disease has been the leading cause of death for both, both men and women in the United States. Closely followed by cancer for both, for both groups, followed by lung disease in women, and unintentional injuries in men. That's what the data says. <laughs> yeah, hold my beer. But it wasn't until the late, early 1990s and 2000s that we really started to see that women are at risk for coronary heart disease. And not only are they at risk, but their outcomes are worse. They have higher in-hospital mortality and worse long-term outcomes. Specifically, they have longer delays in presentation and are less likely to receive guideline-directed care. This led to a number of public health campaigns by the NHLBI and the AHA in the early 2000s to promote knowledge about the fact that women are at risk for coronary artery disease and to promote research to help us understand these discrepancies in care and in outcomes. And while I would perhaps advocate that the bottom advertisement didn't exactly help our cause, 16-year-old <laughs> me wasn't available to make that argument, so that's what we have. And overall, improved understanding and improved awareness of cardiovascular disease in women, in addition to better pharmacologic therapies, have improved outcomes for cardiovascular disease overall. There's been a dramatic decline in mortality from coronary heart disease since the early 2000s, with a particularly impressive curve for women that had kind of been left behind in the 1970s and 1980s, where mortality trends were getting better for women, men, but worse for women. Now, I would love for this to be the end of my talk. You can all go get a cup of coffee before you start your day. But as is probably apparent by the title of my talk, this is not the whole story. In 2006, a study was published in the European Heart Journal that looked at about 4,000 patients who were admitted to the hospital with acute MI and separated their, hospital to, their survival to hospital discharge and their survival at one year by age and gender. And this is a very gray slide, so I apologize up front, but I think the trend is fairly clear. For survival to hospital discharge in older men and older women, there's not a lot of difference. Women do a little bit worse. But at one year, the outcomes for older men and older women are very similar. But what's very different is the fact that young women are much less likely to survive to hospital discharge at one year than men of the same age. This was further confirmed in a study that was published in circulation in 2015 that looked at mortality trends from the 1970s to 2011 and separated them by gender and by age. 
And for men and women over the age of 65, there's been a pretty regular decline in cardiovascular disease mortality. But this line is less impressive for women aged 55 to 64. You can see here the blue line is men and the red line is women. And the line for women is starting to get a lot more flat. And when you look at women under the age of 55, there has essentially been no improvement in mortality since about the mid-1990s. And this mortality trend really matters because we are seeing more and more younger women presenting to the hospital with acute MI. We're seeing more and more younger patients in general presenting to the hospital with acute MI. This is a graph from the ERIC Community Surveillance Study, which was published this year in circulation. So this is very new research. And it looked at the incidence of acute MI hospitalizations for patients 35 to 54. This is a large prospective cohort study that basically looks at patients um, admitted to four communities in the United States. And you can see here, with the red line representing women and the blue line representing men, that the overall incidence of acute MI hospitalizations has been going down for men, but has been slowly increasing for young women under the age of 55. And in fact, when you look at the percentage of hospitalizations for acute MI that are attributable to young people, the curve for young men has been pretty flat, but has been increasing for women. Since the 1990s, the percent of hospitalizations attributable to young women in the United States has increased from 21% to 31%. So how did we get here? Why are young women being left behind in our otherwise successful battle against prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease? As with most complicated problems, I won't stand here and tell you that there is one cause with one easy solution, because that's not realistic. But what I will talk about is things that are putting young women at risk for disease and making their outcomes worse. I'll talk about the fact that they have more risk factor burden, that when they do come to our hospitals, they get less medical therapy and less invasive diagnostics. And I'll talk about how their presentation may ultimately be the reason why they get treatment delays. And we'll start with the most obvious reason why this may be occurring. This is a graph that you've all seen versions of at probably every major talk about cardiovascular disease. Obesity trends in the United States have been increasing for the past 40 or 50 years. The gray line here is men and the black line here is women. And you can see that there are actually more obese women in the United States than there are men. And this trend is true for young people as well. This is all comers, but it's true for young people. And we know that weight gain during the adult years is directly linked to your risk for cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular disease risk factors. And it actually seems to be worse for women than for men. Obesity in and of itself increases your risk of ischemic heart disease by 50%. But the Framingham Heart Study actually looked at the difference between men and women. And for women, it actually increases our risk of ischemic heart disease by 64% compared to 46% in men. So we're seeing more women who are obese with more cardiovascular risk factors, and they're presenting to our hospitals with acute MI. The Genesis Practice Study, which was published in 2014 in the Canadian Journal for Cardiology, looked at young patients under the age of 55 who were being admitted with acute MI and looked at the number of risk factors that they were presenting with and compared the young men and the young women. And actually, young women are more likely than men to present to the hospital with more than three cardiovascular risk factors at the time of their MI. When these risk factors are broken down, women are more likely to have diabetes, they're more likely to have hypertension, and they're more likely to be obese. And this is not isolated information. This is rehashed in study after study that's been published just in the past 10 years. Despite the fact that women tend to have mo more comorbidities at the time of their presentation, they're less likely to get medical therapy. This is also data from the Eric Community Surveillance Study, which I talked to you about earlier. And it looked at 
young women and young men presenting to the hospital with acute MI and whether or not they were likely to get medical therapy. And women had, were 17% less likely to get non-aspirin therapies like Plavix, Ticagrelor, Prasagrel. And they were 13% less likely to get lipid-lowering therapies. And this trend is getting worse, not better. Less women seem to be getting lipid-lowering therapies after presenting with acute MI than they were in the early 2000s. What is probably unsurprising to you is that they also get less invasive diagnostics. Young women presenting with acute MI are 7% less likely to get angiography at all. And what's even more startling is when they do get angiography, they are 21% less likely to get revascularization when they're admitted for MI. And before you ask, this was STEMIs and non-STEMIs, though this data is primarily driven by the NSTEMI group as young women are more likely to present with NSTEMI than STEMI. There was no difference in the utilization of beta blockers. Women were actually more likely to get an echo and the non-invasive stress testing was similar between the two groups. So why might this be the case? This is data that's actually also been shown in older women, um, but the data that's been shown in older women historically has been thought to be because older women are older at the time of their first MI and are more frail. <coughs> it's also been suggested that part of the reason why older women identified with acute MI may get delays in care is because they present with atypical symptoms or no chest pain at all. But that's actually been looked at in younger women. The Virgo study, which has had several publications since from 2015 to 2018, looked at young patients under the age of 55 who were presenting with acute MI and surveyed them as to what symptoms they had before their presentation and their interaction with medical care in regards to those symptoms. And here, the red bars are women and the blue bars are men. And women were actually just as likely as men to present with chest pain. It was 87% versus 89%. But what women do present with is other symptoms and more of them. Women are more likely to have dyspnea, they're more likely to have GI symptoms like Sarah, and they're more likely to have that be their only thing. They're more likely to have palpitations and more likely to have fatigue. This same study looked at women, whether or not patients sought care for these symptoms before they came to the hospital with their MI. And in fact, women were actually more likely to seek care for their symptoms than men, 29% versus 22%. But half of these women were told that their symptoms were non-cardiac in nature. They were told that they did not have coronary disease, even though these were symptoms that were later found to be associated with their MI, versus 36% in men. Women were much more likely than men to be told that their symptoms were related to anxiety. And men were much more likely to be told that their symptoms were related to acid reflux. So I would advocate, humbly, that as the Genesis Praxi authors advocated, that we should not say that women have more atypical symptoms. We should say that they have different symptoms. Because there's some pretty convincing data to suggest that calling it atypical suggests that it's non-cardiac and leads to delays in care. Now, there are certainly other reasons why young women presenting with acute MI may not get revascularization. Women are more likely to have non-obstructive coronary artery disease, but this is not a get out of jail free card. The annual adverse event rate for women with non-obstructive CAD is 4.6%, compared to less than 1% in women who have no disease. But they're less likely to be treated with medical therapy despite this fact. They also have other causes of ACS. This is not a SCAD talk. SCAD is its own topic and its own grand rounds. But I did feel obligated to discuss the fact that we see things other than coronary artery disease in this population. And it's probably under -recognized. SCAD remains a diagnostic challenge. And truly, the prevalence of it is probably unknown. Some observational studies have suggested that the prevalence of SCAD in women under the age of 60 presenting with acute MI may be as high as 25 to 30%. And it's managed differently. So perhaps that's some of the reason why young women coming to the hospital with acute MI aren't getting revascularized because their providers thought it was SCAD. But we really don't have any data to support that. <laughs> 
And with increasing rates of obesity and increasing rates of diabetes, I think we need to be cautious about just saying that women have SCAD as opposed to proving that they have it or don't have it with invasive intravascular imaging like OCT, as you can see in the second bar, or IVIS, to look for a flap or intramural hematoma. When women do get revascularization, newer studies have actually suggested that their mortality is similar. But when, what they do have is more adverse cardiovascular events, primarily driven by the need for repeat revascularization, either with cabbage or with repeat PCI. And this data is primarily driven by the need for target lesion and target vessel revascularization. Now, when I read this study, which was published in CERC um, Quality Outcomes in 2016, before I got to the second paragraph that explained it, I thought that, well, the study was done in 2016, but these PCIs were being done in the late 90s, the early to mid 2000s. So perhaps this is just that women were getting more bare metal stents instead of more drug eluting stents. And we know that bare metal stents have a higher rate of restenosis than drug eluting stents. But in fact, this paper looked at that. And while women were more likely or were less likely to get PCI, similar with other studies, their rates of drug eluting stent use were very, very similar. And they were pretty high. So I don't think that we can attribute this restenosis rate and the need for repeat procedures to just our stents. It may be playing a role, but it doesn't seem to be the whole picture. So women have more risk factors, but their risk is underestimated. But they get less medical therapy, less invasive diagnostics. They have more adverse outcomes and worse outcomes. So what can we do? This is obviously a multifactorial problem that has a lot of arms needed to address it. But I will focus on two main aspects that I think are important in care of these women. The first being risk perception. Risk perception about cardiovascular disease remains poor in the United States in general. This is a busy graph. It's been floating around Twitter the past few weeks, so some of you may have seen it. But I think it's fascinating. And basically, they looked at causes of death, which is the graph or the bar on the right, which is basically a rehashing of the CDC data. And then they looked at what people Google versus what the media reports. The blue is heart disease, the yellow is cancer, the red is terrorism, and the grayish color is homicide. And you can see that we are losing to cancer, homicide, and terrorism. <laughs> Even though the people who made this chart are probably going to die from heart disease. <laughs> and while that's cute and funny, and it is actually also true in patient care. Um, this is also data out of the Virgo study, which surveyed women and men who were admitted to the hospital with acute MI about discussions they had with their providers in regards to their risk for coronary artery disease before their hospitalization. And about half of young men and young women thought that they were at risk for heart disease before their hospitalization. But what's startling is the fact that women, who are the bar graphs in red, were much less likely to be told that they were at risk by their provider, and were even less likely to be counseled about ways to augment their risk. This is even worse when you look at socioeconomic disparities. If you are younger, if you have, are low income, if you have less education, and if you are a minority, you are much less likely to be aware of the fact that you're at risk for coronary artery disease. So my question was, why don't women ask? I go to the doctor, I have a cold, I ask if it's viral or if it's pneumonia. I stub my toe, I ask if it's broken. Why aren't women asking us if they're at risk? And the truth is that about, and this has been looked at, Noelle Barry Mertz, who is in Cedar sinai in LA, published a study about this in 2017 in Jack, where she surveyed women about kind of their thoughts around heart disease. And what was really interesting about this study was that it was multiple choice, yes, but then they allowed for a section for women to just kind of say what they thought in words, free typing. And about half of women just assumed that we would talk to them about it. Most women understood that obesity increased their risk for heart disease, but about a quarter of those women were frankly just too embarrassed to talk about it. <laughs> 
because they were embarrassed to be told, lose 10 pounds and everything will be fine. We need to normalize this conversation for our young women in clinic. This needs to be something we talk about every year, like primary care providers talk about breast cancer and cervical cancer and immunizations and alcohol and driving with a seatbelt. This needs to be something we talk about all the time because we need to make it okay to talk about it. Now, I will admit that this is not entirely our fault. Assessing risk in this population is extremely challenging. Their overall prevalence is low compared to other populations. I actually tried to plug Sarah into our available risk calculators. ASCVD won't even let you put in her numbers for 10-year risk because she's under the age of 40, but it calculates her lifetime risk as 50%. So maybe we should be talking to women about their lifetime risk, not just their 10-year risk. Framingham similarly only gave Sarah a 10-year risk of about 3.3%. Risk calculators for this group are very challenging because they don't take into account everything that we know affects women's risk for cardiovascular disease as they age. Most of the available calculators take into account traditional atherosclerotic risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, whether or not you're physically active, your weight, your lipids. But there are no, a number of emerging non-traditional cardiovascular risk factors that we know increase risk in younger women. Preeclampsia doubles your risk of coronary artery disease in your lifetime. Gestational diabetes, regardless of whether or not you develop diabetes after your pregnancy, quadruples your risk of cardiovascular disease. And autoimmune disease, which we know is more common in younger women, doubles to triples the risk of coronary artery disease. But none of these features are in any of our risk assessment tools. This is partially because women are underrepresented in clinical trials. This is an old study, but I think really proves the point. It looked at all women admitted to the hospital with acute MI and whether they were enrolled in clinical trials. And, about, and women account for about 40% of hospitalizations for acute MI in the United States but only account for about 20 to 25% of patients enrolled in clinical trials. And while it would be great if I could stand here and tell you that after 2000, we got a lot better at this, more recent studies, including Culprit Shock and COACT, which was um, discussed at ACC this year, still only have 20 to 25% women enrolled in their trials. The long-awaited ischemia trial just published its enrollment data a few months ago, and only 22% of their patients are women. So this, is prob this doesn't seem to be getting better anytime soon, so we need to figure out how to counsel our patients, probably without meaningful RCT data. So we talked about risk perception, and because I'm going to be an interventional cardiologist, I'm now going to talk to you about what we can do with our approach to treatment in the cath lab. I've already discussed the fact that women have more repeat revascularization, primarily driven by target lesion and target vessel revascularization. But it doesn't seem to entirely be explained by the number and type of stents we're using. So what are other things that are leading to this problem? Part of it may be the fact that women simply have smaller blood vessels. This has actually been looked at in a sub-study or a subgroup analysis of the prospect study where they looked at young women presenting to the hospital with acute MI and did intravascular ultrasound to look at their arteries. And women, regardless of BSA, were more likely to have smaller blood vessels and were more likely to have more smaller blood vessels. And we know that this matters because people with small vessels get small stents, and we know that small stents lead, have higher rates <coughs> of restenosis. This is a really nice study that was published this year in, 20, in um, the International Journal of Cardiology that looked at women who underwent PCI and looked at their rates of target lesion revascularization and stent thrombosis based on stent size. And they basically grouped them into small, intermediate, and large, with small being less than 2.75 and large being greater than 3.25. And as you get smaller, your rates of need for target lesion revascularization go up. Stent thrombosis was uncommon, as it is in clinical practice, but going from an intermediate-sized stent to a small stent doubled your risk of stent thrombosis. 
So what this highlighted for me is that while we always try to give patients the largest stent possible because we know that this is a problem, it may be even more important in women to ensure that we are doing routine intravascular imaging, not only to give women the biggest stent possible, but to make sure we're not missing other causes of ACS in this population. Because as I said earlier, we're probably missing a lot of SCAD. <laughs> But that's its own talk. So I'll close by t telling you about Sarah. Again, I swear these videos worked last week, <laughs> yesterday. Um, but Sarah, after a discussion about whether or not to do cabbage versus PCI, since she was a diabetic with proximal LED disease, elected to undergo PCI to her LED. She had OCT before to rule out other causes of ischemia. And in fact, she just had routine atherosclerotic disease at 29 years old. She was a year younger than me when we did her angiogram. But she's done very well and actually had a baby earlier this year. So in conclusion, more women are being admitted to our hospitals with acute MI. They remain undertreated and underrecognized. As providers, we need to normalize these discussions Frankly, women are underrepresented in clinical trials, so we probably need to be a little bit more creative about risk assessment in this group. Because understanding this risk is critical as young women have decades of future life expectancy and quality of life which are placed at risk by this disease. So I'd like to thank all the people who helped me with this talk, in particular my co-fellows who listened to many, many iterations of this. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank the UW faculty and in particular, the ECHO and the cath lab staff who have been so instrumental in my training. And I'd like to thank my husband for putting up with me for the past three years and agreeing to put up with me for another two years as an interventional fellow. <laughs> thank you. No questions, great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. More women are single moms. I wonder if that has a significant effect over the decades, recent decades, in terms of stress, work, environment. I don't know that work has been looked at. There's reasonable data that stress is associated with poorer outcomes. Um, but it's not really work, I think, that is a problem because the older trials that looked at women in general showed that women were less likely to seek care sometimes because of taking care of the kids at home, making dinner for their husband. So I don't know that work, like traditional work in the sense of like, I come to a job every day, is any more, causes the patient to have any more risk than just being a mom at home. Dr. Levy. Imagine most young women are getting their care through OBGYN versus family practice or system students. Are they any less likely to discuss cardiovascular risk factors with them? Yes, there was, I almost put a, um, a paper about that in this talk. Um, there is a really nice study also from Noelle Barry Mertz that looked at um, basically 100 PCPs and 100 <laughs> cardiology providers. And it didn't look at how likely they were to talk about risk, but it looked at where they placed cardiovascular disease in priority about counseling patients. And it was a third under weight loss and breast cancer, even though most of these women are more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than breast cancer. Not that breast cancer isn't important, but that has been looked at. And I think that definitely part of what needs to be done is we need to be counseling primary care providers about just talking to patients about risk. They don't need to you know, send them for a stress test if they're asymptomatic, but just normalizing the conversation so that it's something you talk about every year. Dr. Otter. That fantastic talk. You know, they talked about all the um, reasons why coronary disease might present differently in women and be treated differently with the size and risk factors. But, you know, kind of the elephant in the room is, you know, what about how we react to patients, how we treat patients, you know, are there biases in this? Because you know, it's not just coronary disease. I mean, women with atrial fibrillation have more symptoms and present to their doctors and are treated less and get fewer abortions and have fewer treatments. 
when we heart failure get diagnosed late, get less treatment. 100%. So it's not, it's not just coronary disease and, you know, different symptoms. Like men who have the typical symptoms in there. But uh, and women have typical symptoms. We just have textbooks wrong. But, you know, so how do you address the, how do you address those issues that, you know, whatever biases in our whole healthcare system or individual biases, how do you, how do you change that? Oh, that is such a big question. <laughs> yes, I mean, obviously, at the core of any talk about treatment and outcome disparities is bias. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, it's a huge problem that is true of, as you stated, basically every disease that you look at, for the most part, aside from maybe breast cancer, women are undertreated and underrecognized. Um, I hope that we can improve patient people, providers, at least thinking about this by talking about it more. Dr. Dean. And just to follow on with that, that topic, um, part of this is, is more, right? I mean, you've shown the pictures of the American Heart Association's efforts, and I think we've done a disservice by marking the atypical word. You, you, you brought that up. I don't know what word should be used, but we need to tell women and men and physicians and the community how to, you know, how to, this atypical word has, has gotten us into a problem. Agree. As I said, I don't know which word it should be. Different, I don't think it's maybe the right word. Um, but we, we marketed this very yep. poorly. And I think that's part of the problem. So it's going to take a consistent, we got to figure out what we're going to what we're gonna say, and we got to consistently say it. It's got to be across the population and medical schools and our, our teaching programs to, to, to reset the clock here. Yep. And, I, and I think talks like this are where we go with this. But it needs to be um, more consistent with the word. I, think. I agree. Yep. I think we've, it has somehow become a typical means non cardiac, which is not the case. Um, yes. I think I know the answer to this question, but um, it occurs to me that maybe the Go Red movement and all of that has actually increased awareness and results in a higher incidence because of more recognition. If you understand what I'm saying, if there's an increase. In the, in the numbers of cases is because people are presenting because they start thinking maybe they've got a heart problem. Sure, I think that might be true. Um, but even with that, people have more diabetes and more obesity and... And less treatment. Know, and less treatment. Um, and I mean, when they're coming to the hospital, it's not like they're coming to the hospital with chest pain and their EKG is normal and they have normal troponins. They're coming to the hospital and have ACS. So certainly... It may be that we're seeing it more because people are coming to the hospital. I hope that's true. But even if that's partially true, they're still getting undertreated. So if we're recognizing the problem but not treating it, I feel like we probably haven't exactly solved the problem. Back to your, your slide on the interview of the, diet, the causes of death and the internet searches. Just so you know, Rob Taylor showed the same slide last week. So you have yes. good taste and good choice there. Perfect. But, you know, but why do you bother with the doctors? Why not just go to the patients? Why not change it that people's Google searches match for cervical and diet? Why not get it out there on the internet? Why not let women just go get their own cholesterol and, and, sugar and glucose done and let them all check their own and put the risk calculators out there and let them do it themselves? I, mean, I, you know, I, I think trying to educate the primary care doctors to do all these things when they have so much else to do and they're already overwhelmed, why not just put it in the hands of the patients? I think that it would be great if women could advocate for themselves, and I think that more public health campaigns have improved women's ability to advocate for themselves. But if I can say something a little controversial, I think <clears> that many of us aren't listening when they come to our clinic worrying about their abdominal pain. Well, I think it's just like not the, necessarily uh, us, but it's just like the word atypical when they chose a dress for the women's heart disease. I think they picked the wrong symbol at the wrong time. Because look at how many women in this room are wearing dresses. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and, and the other, just again, the other point behind this is you showed where's the risk calculator? Yeah, there isn't one. Where we is can't, the, yeah. The big data and all the things that we have. 
are you even addressing this in a meaningful way so that the physicians can perhaps have that conversation? Because when you put it in the risk calculator, yep. it's hard to find information. It's because we're not studying it. Uh, yes. I think it would be interesting, I don't know if you've talked about that, also about female representation among cardiologists. I think, like, like who are the people conducting these research studies? Like, who are, you know, I think a lot of the driver of, you know, breast health is because a lot of OBGYNs maybe have more female representation, and so they're having more conversations around their own group experiences and so forth. So I think another question is, like, why don't we have better female representation across our and then yeah. maybe if we increase female representation, we might be having more studies that include women or more conversations yes. focused about women health. I think that's another like big elephant in the room. Is you look at some of these fellowship programs, you know, our entire cohort of next year is all you know. Talk about yes, female representation. female representation in cardiology is also its own grand rounds. <laughs> um, I think there's it's still only about twenty percent and seven percent for intervention. Well, like, like if your cardiologist is a woman, do you want to get different treatment? Yeah, I think there have actually been studies on that that women are potentially more likely to get more aggressive care when they're seen by a woman, but I didn't focus on that for this talk, frankly. Yes. Uh, common question. I think the community-based studies like here uh, show that we're not we're not missing these diagnoses, or it isn't because people uh, because of public information campaigns, people report them more. I mean, that, is that the people are following along to yeah. these studies? So. Uh, but you did show that there was a pretty dramatic increase in uh, from about 2002 on. It clearly that whatever caused that is incompletely affected right. in a lot of ways. What, what do you think it can help? I mean, I think it's a lot that our medical therapies have gotten a lot better. I mean, I think, I mean, I think public health campaigns have helped women come to the hospital, but obviously a lot of this is the fact that we're treating people with statins, we're treating people with aspirin, we're looking for disease and then appropriately treating them for secondary prevention with the caveat that women are slightly less likely to get that secondary prevention. Um, I think a lot of it is medical therapy. Well, temporarily that has to do with smoking. Right, and smoking campaigns. Yeah. So it was public campaigning, not one-on-one -on -one physician patient. Right, it was public campaigning. The outcome. But if you look at the end of that of that CDC trend, it's kind of going up again, probably because of obesity and so other. Public campaigning, not one-on-one -on -one physician. That would be it. Katie, yeah. I, I think we we do all have to check our biases with every patient that comes in because there there are things that can be done in a public health issue, but there ultimately it comes down to the individual that's in front of us. And all of us think in certain ways, and we need to challenge those paradigms whenever patients come in front of us. In terms of the public campaign, this is a persisting problem. This has been going on for a long time, as you very eloquently showed. And unfortunately, some of the things that have been wildly successful in other areas have been when a celebrity gets the disease and is very upfront about it. So way back in the day when Nancy Reagan got breast cancer and had a mastectomy and was very public about that, it led to a wave of mastectomies all over the country, probably unnecessary ones as well. <laughs> so unfortunately, what we really need is a young woman who's a celebrity to have an MI. And obviously, you know, there are privacy issues, so I don't think in the, for the good of society anyone should disclose that <laughs> doesn't want to. But but this this is very effective in our modern world, unfortunately. Well, I'd like to say I'll work on that, but no. but <laughs> seems, that seems challenging. Thank you. Thank you.